morning, I want to just um, begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive back in. This is really the, the second week of a Fear of the Lord series, and uh, we're going to actually continue where we started last week um, regarding the fear of the Lord. If, in case you're, you're wondering, hey, did we talk about the fear of the Lord? Did we define it? Did we describe it? No, we still haven't even gotten there. We're still talking about the domestication of God. Um, really, the reason why it's so important that we fear the Lord, I wanted to preface that by what the scripture says about um, why, it's, why mankind is so prone to think so lightly of God, which really is why we need to fear the Lord. So we're going to continue that this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the, its clarity. And uh, Lord, every time we direct our attention to it, we are immediately aware that we're hearing from you. And we are also aware that we need it. Um, and yet, Lord, even our awareness of our need is, is uh, so often weak and smaller than it ought to be. And so we just want to come before you this morning and humbly ask for help, ask for grace, especially as we think about this topic of not fearing you the way that you ought to be feared. Um, I ask, Lord, that the text that we're going to be looking at this morning would benefit our hearts and minds, and that it would instill in us a greater desire to grow in the fear of you, and that it would even prepare us for next week looking more at a positive side of what fear of the Lord actually is, and uh, the definition of it, what it is and is not. And so, Lord, we, we invite you, we, we beg you that you would do whatever it takes in our lives to fear you the way that you ought to be feared, the way that you must be feared. And so root out any subtle excuse, any way that we think about you in a way that's too trivial, that's too insignificant, any way that we despise your word or think lightly of your person or make an excuse for disregarding a thought about what you think about our thoughts, our motives, our actions, and the meditations of our hearts. And so we just ask that you do that by the power of your spirit through your word this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, just by way of review, we did talk about the fact that there's something much more sinister and much more dark than the worst actions you could perpetrate on God's earth, and that would be the sin in your soul that would think thoughts about God that are too small for him. Thinking about God in a way that's less than he actually is. Uh, this is the worst man can do. Thinking about, thought, thinking about God in a way that demean him or think too lightly of him. We saw last week that man is so depraved, he's so depraved that he naturally, he just naturally goes in a direction where he tends to domesticate God. Uh, we imagine him to be altogether safe and tame, and we imagine that we, he is actually under our control, and often how we relate to God and how we regard God becomes uh, something that we use for our own good. I told you the story about the uh, lady who owned a, quote unquote, owned, <laughs> owned a Bengal tiger. And when you start to view a 500 pound Bengal tiger as your pet, bad things happen. And that was, of course, the case in, this, in that news clipping of the woman who died by her own pet that she supposedly owned. And it's even worse if we imagine that we own God. It's even worse if we domesticate God. It's even worse when we start to view him as something tame and safe and something that's under our control. Um, we domesticate God several ways. Last week we saw, number one, we domesticate God by viewing him as needy, viewing God as needy. This is what happens when we reimagine God in our own image. We create him in our own image. Uh, we we perceive him in our own image, and Psalm 50 describes that kind of domestication of God, and if you remember that, um, it's just by way of review, a couple symptoms of what happens to the religious worshiper who starts to domesticate God in this way. If we start to recreate God in our own image, 
One of the symptoms of that is that your contributions to the church and your labors for the Lord will start to, start to have a flavor of entitlement. You start to imagine that you're doing something for God, and he's needy, and he ought to be grateful for your contributions, and you start to have a little bit of entitlement. You start to serve the Lord with strings attached. There's, there's asterisks on the contract of your obedience, and you have expectations about how it's going to go for you, or what God might owe you, or how he ought to respond to you. There's often... Self-righteousness. If we view God as needy, then we'll often be self-righteous toward God and toward others. And inevitably, if we view God as needy, then we will be marked by ingratitude. Because we will expect that God benefits from our labors and from our obedience. And we're not content to just simply be grateful for the opportunity and the privilege to just simply serve God. Worshiping God and obeying God and trembling in his presence ought to be enough for mankind. But when we view God as needy, we will be marked by entitlement, self-righteousness, or ingratitude, or all three. Secondly, we saw that um, mixing our own desires with his is a domestication of God. God's desires ought to be all that matter. But when we mix ours with his, we have this really cumbersome problem of trying to serve ourselves and meet our own desires while obeying the Lord. We saw in Malachi chapter 1, in that second address in the prophecy of Malachi, we saw that some of the marks or some of the symptoms of mixing our own desires with the fear of the Lord is really the, the worshiper who worships this way, he's going to view obedience as a burden. Obedience becomes a burden for this guy. He's going to be weary. He's going to have a weariness associated with uh, maintaining this mixture of his own desires and God's desires. And then ultimately, as Malachi documented, this guy will disdain God. He will disdain God's commands because the cost involved with obedience is too great. It actually will, it will always oppose the desires of the Lord. You cannot serve God in mammon, Jesus said. And Malachi said, you disdain obedience because you sniff at obedience because it just costs you too much and it actually cuts across the desires that you have not given up. And so that's another way that we tend to domesticate God. This morning I want to look at a text in 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings 17. And, and the third way that we domesticate God is, and, and of course I, I'm saying three because I'm trying to give you a sampling of different different aspects of what the scriptures talk about. This is by no means comprehensive, but this is an important one. One of the ways that we can domesticate God is by viewing God as the dispenser of our good. Viewing God as the dispenser of our good. And this is a very common way to domesticate God in the church. Um, this is, a, a, again, this is an unnecessary tactic for the pagan. The pagan does not need to have, bother himself by viewing God as the means of getting what he wants. He just goes after what he wants and uses whatever means possible. But in the church, this is a very, very subtle idol. To start to view our relationship with God as the means for getting what we, what we have defined as our good. And we're going we're gonna to see in this passage why that's so problematic, but... Before we get there, I, I, I do want to make a comment, just to clarify. You might hear that point, you might say that viewing God as the dispenser of our good, you might think that sounds kind of like a problem, it sounds a little bit problematic. If I viewed God as just this cosmic dispenser of what I want, very similar to the second point we saw last week, but what's unique about this is that it's the definition of good as defined by me. When I start to see God as the dispenser of good as defined by me, I've domesticated God. I've turned him into a dispenser of something that I want. I'm trying to tame him and keep him under my control. However, we will also see, hopefully if we have time in this series, we'll also see in the scriptures that part of fearing the Lord is fearing the Lord because he's good. In fact, not to give away too much, but if you read Jeremiah 33 verses 8 and 9, 
Jeremiah prophesies that in the latter days, in the kingdom, the nations of the world will see how good Christ is to Israel, and they will fear God because he's so good to his own people. And we will also see all over scripture that God's commandments are always for our good. So the problem here is not that obeying the Lord and fearing the Lord is for your best. The problem is when we define what is good for us and then we view God as a means of getting that. That is the problem. Look at 2 Kings verse uh, 17, verses 7 all the way through verse 41. We've got a long passage, but it's going to fly. It's a pretty fast-paced action sequence here. It's a little bit, um, a little bit it's loaded with an introduction from verses 17, uh, 7 through 23, and then the story particularly picks up in verse 24 to 41. This is the story of the, conquer, uh, the, the defeat of the northern tribes, the nation of Israel, at the hands of Assyria, uh, the Assyrian king and his armies. You'll hear the word Samaria in here. This is really the beginning of the, the Samarian story, because if you remember Jesus on the road, when he goes through Samaria, he's, he's, he's walking through an unclean land. It was viewed as unclean by the purebred Jews because they were intermarried Jews. They were half-breeds between Assyrian blood and Jewish blood, and that was Assyria. This is actually the story of how Assyria, of Samaria becoming such an unclean territory within the borders of Israel because of what happens in this very story. So let's just read the whole thing. Let's just go straight through. Verse 7. Now this came about, talking about verses 1 through 6, namely, the Assyrian captivity. They conquered the ten northern tribes. This came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations, whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel, and in the customs of the kings of Israel, which they had introduced. The sons of Israel did things secretly, which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set for themselves sacred pillars, an asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense on all the high places, as the nations did when the Lord had carried away, uh, carried away to exile before them. And they did evil things, provoking the Lord. They served idols concerning which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep, your command, keep my commandments, my statutes, according to all the law which I have commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. However, they did not listen but stiffened their neck like their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he made with their fathers, and his warnings which he, with which he warned them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. They forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves molten images, even two calves, and made an Asherah and worshipped all the host of, the, of heaven and served Baal. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire and practiced divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. Also Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs which Israel had introduced. The Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the, hands of, the hand of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. When he had torn Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel away from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. The sons of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel from his sight, as he spoke through all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away into exile from their own land to Assyria until this day. The king of Assyria 
brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and Sepharvaim, and they settled them in the cities of Samaria in place of the sons of Israel. So they possessed Samaria and lived in its cities. At the beginning of their living there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have carried away into exile in the cities of Samaria do not know the custom of the God of the land. So he has sent lions among them, and behold, they kill them, because they do not know the custom of the God of, that, of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Take there one of the priests whom you carried away into exile, and let him go and live there, and let him teach them the custom of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away into exile from Samaria came and lived at Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the houses of the high places which the people of Samaria had made, every nation in their cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, the men of Kuth made Nurgle, the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sepharvites burned their children in the fire to Adramelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sepharvaim. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves priests of the high places who acted for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord. And served their own gods, according to the custom of the nations from a whom, among whom they had been carried away into exile. To this day they do according to their earlier customs. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes, or their ordinances, or the law, or the commandments which the Lord commanded the son of, sons of Jacob, which he, whom he named Israel." with whom the Lord made a covenant and commanded them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow down yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord, who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power and with an outstretched arm, him you shall fear, and to him you shall bow yourselves down, and to him you shall sacrifice. The statutes and the ordinances and the law, and the commandment which he wrote for you, you shall observe to do forever, and you shall not fear other gods. The covenant I have made with you, you shall not forget, and you shall not fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. However, they did not listen, but they did according to their earlier custom. So while these nations feared the Lord, they also served their idols. Their children likewise and their grandchildren, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. I find it complete, just very compelling that the narrator continues to repeat as a refrain the fear of the Lord all the way through this story. There's the fear of other gods, and there's the fear of Yahweh, the true God. And the people are described on multiple occasions as fearing the Lord and fearing other gods. Or fearing the Lord and serving their own idols. Or fearing the Lord and appointing for themselves high priests in these high places for cultic, idolatrous worship. And over and over and over again, throughout the story, you might have picked up on that refrain. that They are described as fearing the Lord and. Fearing the Lord and. And fearing the Lord and. They've got other desires, <clears throat> other things thereafter. Why bother with fearing the Lord? Well, because lions are eating them. And let's just be honest, no self-loving person wants to be eaten by a lion. There's a lot of reasons to quote-unquote, fear the Lord. A lot of self-loving reasons to fear the Lord. But by the time you get to verse 34, you are longing for clarity. What are you saying here, narrator? And finally, he says in verse 34, they don't fear the Lord. And that's really the first time where they are dogmatically declared as not fearing the Lord because what he's been describing this entire story is fearing the Lord plus, 
fearing the Lord and fearing the Lord compatible with some other fear of other gods, which is obviously not the case. They are incompatible. And so, as a conclusion of the story, it's just incredible writing, because verse 41 goes back to the positive, kind of the sarcastic description of fearing the Lord. Verse 41 says, So while these nations feared the Lord, they also served their idols. And it's this kind of compatibilism, this kind of syncretism, this kind of admixture of the fear of the Lord with using Yahweh to get your own personal gain that is then passed on for generations, generation after generation after generation, which is what's so compelling about the fear of the Lord is if you fear the Lord, the tendency is that your influence will pass on a fear of the Lord to your children. If you view the Lord as a means for your personal gain, you will tend to pass on to your children a view that uses the Lord for personal gain. And that's what this story so clearly teaches us. And so before we dive into the story starting in verse 24, let me make a couple comments on this introduction. There's some highlights from the introduction starting in verse 7 all the way through verse 23 that is, it's really, really helpful for us before we kind of fly through the story itself. Uh, I took the time to read it because I wanted you to see every verse. I wanted you to have the whole thing familiar in your mind as we walked through it. So I'm just going to point out a few little observations here. This is not comprehensive or systematic, but just a few observations that help us understand the story. Notice from verse 7 to 23, the focus is on Israel throughout. They are the ones being captive. They are the ones taken captive by Assyria. And it's interesting as well, this is happening around 722 B.C. And in the story, the narrator is bringing up the history of three centuries prior. So it's fascinating. If, you, if you're not familiar with the timeline here, we are well into the story of Israel and Judah as a split. Uh, they are the northern nation, the southern nation. It's been that way for about three centuries and in uh, two and a half at least. And if you look at um, verse 21, the narrator goes back into the history of the house of David, going all the way back to Jeroboam, who is not a son of David, who was the first king of the northern tribes. The, 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 his name is Jeroboam. Meanwhile, while Jeroboam was ruling in the north, Rehoboam, a, an actual son of David, he was the, a grandson, a son through, the, through uh, Solomon, he was ruling in the south, ruling the, the tribes of Judah. So the narrator is making a clear, compelling case to explain, here's how you make sense of the story of Israel. How do you make sense of a nation that had so much instruction, had access to the law of God, that had access to true divine worship, and that had so much spiritual privilege, and they ended up in captivity to Assyria, and let's just document that going back to Jeroboam all the way to Hosea. Here's the story. And he just puts a tag on that describing a nation that has used God for personal gain. They don't fear the Lord like they ought. The focus is on Israel throughout. But also, notice in verse 13, yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah. Verse 19, well, verse 18 says, um, the Lord was angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. And you think, oh, okay, Judah survives because they were so godly. They feared the Lord. Nope, verse 19. Also, Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God. But they walked in the same customs. By God's grace, Judah was still standing for another 140 years. But notice the emphasis on Israel, but there is this warning to Judah. As the story is being written, watch out, Judah. Consider your ways. And that becomes a charge to us this morning. Watch out, GBC. We need to consider our ways. We need to examine ourselves. Do we tend, and are we aware, I know we tend, but are we aware of the tendency to view God as a means for our personal gain. You see, a true fear of the Lord is not primarily motivated by what we get out of the worship of the Lord. A true fear of the Lord is, can be distinct from all of the things that are so rich and abundant and blessed 
for the true God-fearer. I mean, just think about it. I got to take one of my boys on a, on a trip a couple weeks ago, and we got to go skiing, and we were in the mountains, and we were watching snow and mountains and just incredible nature, and it's just beautiful, and we're enjoying skiing together. And Those who can't stand God can enjoy skiing, they can enjoy the snow in a superficial way. Only a God-fearer can have an appropriate perspective on skiing. Think about the benefits of fearing the Lord in your own family. Fearing the Lord makes for a better marriage. Fearing the Lord makes for a better relationship with your kids. Think about the benefit of fearing the Lord when it comes to your own finances. When you fear the Lord and you have self-control and you view those resources as a stewardship of God, it's often the case that that makes for better finances. Think about all the benefits that you receive in the church by virtue of God-fearing. If you're surrounded by godly people, you'll have more respect. Christians think more highly of you. Think about the biblical principles for living your life. If you fear the Lord, you tend to have better health and be in better shape. Think about fearing the Lord and how benefit, beneficial that is for your own mind. Freedom from guilt, forgiveness of sin, avoidance of hell and condemnation eternally, assurance of heaven. None of these things are wrong in themselves. Some of them are wrong to want, like respect and fear of man. Those are wrong to want. But if you fear the Lord and people think highly of you, that's not a sin in and of itself. Wanting it is a sin. But regardless of what is on that list, wanting any of those things more than for God to be glorified as the God of the universe is sin. If we turn God into the means of our own personal gain, we're, we're domesticating him. And that was a warning for Israel uh, that they did not listen to and they were taken captive. And their captivity would then serve as a warning for Judah, and they also did not listen. We have the privilege of listening. We have the privilege of benefiting from this story. A couple more observations on this introduction. Look at verse 9. The sons of Israel did things secretly which were not right against the Lord their God. That's the way it is, isn't it? In a religious context, it's always secretly. Uh, I mean, it takes, a, it takes a long time where a religious uh, context or community or um, denomination becomes so defunct that external, complete external disregard for the fear of the Lord would be accepted in any sort of casual variety. This is the way it always goes, though, in religious contexts. These things start to happen secretly. So externally, it's possible to keep Fearing the Lord, and I'll use the, 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 the term fear of the Lord the way our author is using it so consistently with the exception of verse 34 where he finally says they're not fearing the Lord. So often they're described as fearing the Lord and. And what, what happens here is, is that the religious fear of the Lord that becomes um, compromised, this type of domestication of God, starts to put God in a box by doing the externals according to the fear of the Lord but secretly being comfortable with doing what I want. See, if fear of the Lord doesn't constrain the inward thoughts, the inward impulse, in the quietness of our own heart, soul, and mind, in the inner secrets where no one in this church could know, where not even your own spouse could know, where only God in heaven could possibly know, if the fear of the Lord is not enough to constrain you in the secret inner thoughts. You've domesticated God. Is it enough? Is it enough for you to be consumed with the fear of the Lord and to be terrified with offending Him in your 
secret inner life and to be consumed with pleasing him in your secret inner life. And perhaps even just seeing verse 9 on the page of Scripture and looking at that verse, the sons of Israel did things secretly which were not right against the Lord their God. The, the conscience might be ringing right now and saying, wow, I think my fear of the Lord is not what it ought to be. And whatever your conscience is pointing to, it's probably not pointing to an external. It's probably pointing to an inner motive. It's not, I mean, sure, if, if your words are objectively displeasing to the Lord, they are objectively displeasing to the Lord. But quite often, the way this works in a religious context, the way we domesticate God is we know what we can say and get away with, but then our motives are go unchecked. And we might be motivated by what we get personally by how we used our words. We might be motivated by some desire that we've decided is good for us. And those motives that happen in the secret place, that is really where the traction of fear of God must prevail. So these, these people are doing things secretly while externally fearing the Lord. The essential location where the fear of the Lord that shows itself is in the primacy of the heart. If you strive to please God in your actions, but you are not consumed with the fear of him in your thoughts and your motives and the intentions of your heart, then you are domesticating God. Additionally, before we dive into this story, look at verse 14. They didn't listen. Listen to these synonyms of, of this fear of the Lord. Of, uh, the, 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 the domesticated fear of the Lord that our author is describing here is described in verse 14 as not listening. It's described as being stiff-necked or obstinate. And stiff-necked with regard to listening to God's word is an obstinate heart. It's hard-hearted, stiff-necked. And then in 14c, it's described as, not, as unbelief. They didn't believe God. So, verse 14 is extremely helpful because if we look at our lives and we see areas where we are domesticating God and our fear of the Lord is not what it ought to be, we do not flatter, we, we dare not flatter ourselves and just say, oh, that's just, you know, that's unfortunate. I just need to grow more. Well, that might be true. It might be unfortunate and we might need to grow more. But we need to say the same thing about it that God says. And God says that domesticating God in our hearts is if not a characteristic, it's in a moment, it's described as not listening, stiff-necked, and unbelief. Additionally, look at verse 15. Here we have a quote, um, uh, I mean not a quote, a statement that is picked up by Jeremiah as a quote. It's quoted in Jeremiah 2.5. Namely, in the middle of this verse, it says, and they followed vanity and became vain. That entire phrase is word for word, Jeremiah 2.5. Jeremiah, in his prophecy, uh, picks up this phrase, and he uses it in Jeremiah 2.5 to describe an idolatrous worship of the Lord. It's the combination of the fear of the Lord um, with unbelief, and it's what happens in religious contexts. Um, we start to create God after our own image, we make him vain, and then we become like whatever we worship. And that's true all over the scriptures. That's true in Psalm 115. That's true in Psalm 135. Uh, the description is that the idolater becomes as blind as the idol. The idolater becomes as deaf as the idol. The idolater becomes as mute as the idol. So if we pursue vanity and we pursue emptiness, we become vain and we become empty. If I pursue the idol of self, and self-significance and personal preeminence, I become as empty and as vain as John Anderson. These people pursued vanity and they became vain. This is the end result of any domestication of God. You're left with nothing of substance because you take all the substance and combine it with vanity and the vanity sucks out all the substance of God-fearing. So, to get back to our point here, we domesticate God by 
using God to get what we want. Using God to get what we want. And as we go through this narrative in a very break, a breakneck speed, I want in your mind, I want you to have in your mind James chapter 4. In the book of James, he asks a very important rhetorical question. What's the cause of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your members? Is it not your desires, your lusts? And of course, he uses the word lust there not in just an exclusively um, sexual way, but lust in the sense of strong desire. And you have something that you want and you don't get it, so you fight and quarrel and devour. And then you might even ask God for getting what you want. And then sometimes you don't have what you want because you didn't ask. And sometimes you actually ask God for it, but it was, a, it was a lust. And so he didn't give it to you. And he puts an incredible exclamation in that whole discussion in verse 4 when he says, You adulteresses! And he calls people in a religious context who are using God to get what they believe is good. And he calls that adultery. It's the same as idolatry. Idolatry equals spiritual adultery. Viewing our relationship with God as a means to get another love. It would be as grotesque as a, a wife asking a husband for enough money to go spend it on another man. Adultery. Spiritual adultery. And so, here we have spiritual adultery. Using God to get what we want. How do we do that? Well, according to verses 24 to 29, 28, we um, fear God to benefit personally. It's very clear. You remember in this section from verse 24 to 28, after the king uh, settles Assyrians, native Assyrians, into Samaria, uh, the Lord, verse 25b, sends lions among them, which killed some of them. Okay? Not, not a good circumstance. Not desirable. So they're walking around, going, from, going to school, going to the grocery store. They're getting eaten by lions. People are getting picked off left and right. And they're thinking, oh, this isn't good. This is not a fun way to live. What's going on? And they know it's the Lord. So verse 26, they actually speak to the king saying, hey, look, the nation that you carried away, and <clears throat> we're settling here in Samaria. We don't know the God of the, of the land. We don't know the custom of how you're supposed to live here. So the God of this land is devouring us with lions. So the king says, okay, let's send back some priests. So we got some pe- priests here in prison. Let's send them back. They can do a little seminar. We'll call it a Fear of the Lord 101 seminar. And we're just going to train up the people in the fear of the Lord so you know how to go about your lives and not get eaten by lions. And we'll fund it so that everybody can take it for free. And then it'll be highly attended because no one wants to be eaten by lions. And so when you pass the class, then you get a little badge that says you fear the Lord. Way to go. Congratulations. Verse 28. So one of the priests they had carried away into exile came uh, from Samaria, came and lived at Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Great. No one wants to go to hell. No one wants to get eaten by lions. There's so many self-loving reasons to fear the Lord. But fear of the Lord is not compelled by personal gain. Fear of the Lord is compelled by God's gain. It's compelled by what God thinks. It's compelled by what God wants. It's compelled by what God desires. Isn't that what's so unique about a godly, reverential, true, biblical, robust, healthy fear of the Lord? Is you know it when you see yourself preferring something that gives God glory at great personal expense. You know it when you see the Spirit of God within you producing such a fear of you that it would actually cost you to follow his commands and, his, and to obey him and to fear him. Suddenly there's, 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 there's no ulterior motive possible to be able to please the Lord in the quiet privacy of your own heart where no one could know that that battle was won except the Lord. What a privilege. This fear of the Lord, that's a dime a dozen. The fear of the Lord that's External and 
does it for personal gain? How could that person know they fear the Lord? I mean, no one wants to get eaten by a lion. Fear God to benefit personally. That's step number one. That's how you, want to, that's how you use God to get what you want. Step number two, fear God and harbor idols. Fear God and harbor idols. Starting in verse 29, this is where that litany happens, a long list of idolatry. Verse 29, every nation still made gods of its own and put them in houses in the high places which the people of Samaria made. Every nation in their cities in which they lived. I mean, how ironic is that? Samaria had made high places and the nations come, the pagan nations, with their own man-made gods. And guess what? There's an, there's an idolatrous hole in the heart of every high place that Samaria built. I mean, it fits perfectly. They're completely compatible. Oh, Samaria moved out. We move in with our idols. Put those right in those same high places. Uh, it says that the men of Babylon made Succoth Manoth. That's just a Hebrew phrase that means um, um, dwelling places of the daughters. And this is um, most likely, and of all accounts that I read, most likely a uh, highly... Uh, 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 fornicate a vulgar type of worship uh, where places of dwelling would be built for the sake of religious religious uh, fornication the the places of dwelling for the daughters and that's part of the worship of uh, Babylon the men of Kuth made Nurgle Nurgle is the god of the underworld in Mesopotamia and um, he's a deity associated with fire and the heat of the sun. He developed into the god of war, pestilence, death. Um, he even had an, a consort named Arishkagal who ruled Urkala, the netherworld. So this is kind of like the Babylonian pantheon. This is like the, the Babylonian mythology. And Nurgle would have been one of the chief gods in the Babylonian pantheon. In, uh, also in verse 30, C, the men of Hamath made Ashima. Shema is very difficult to trace out. Um, the name appears in some papyri, and uh, apparently in a, in a papyri that's, that's, a, that's from a, a post-Jewish influence because they described Ashima as the consort of Yahweh, which is about as vulgar and, and uh, syncretistic as you could possibly get. probably related to Asherah, the name of the Canaanite mother goddess, but we're not totally sure. Nibhaz, in verse 31, the Avites made Nibhaz. This is absolutely otherwise unknown, except for this reference. We know nothing about Nibhaz. Um, and Tartuk, uh, most people don't take a stab at Tartuk, but um, one source identified Tartuk as a, tar uh, a Targetus, who was a form of the Western Semitic great goddess. And uh, that's possible. The names are similar, but that's just a, uh, a guess. Adramelech, in verse um, 31b, Adramelech and Enamelech are the gods of Sepharvaim. And it's a Hebrew compound that literally just means powerful is the king. And um, ironically, it's also the name of uh, King Sennacherib's murderer, and possibly even his son as well in 2 Kings 19.37. Um, uh, powerful is the king, or Adar is the king. And so this, is, this goes back to the Babylonian pantheon, and um, he would have been the god of heaven, and Enamelech would have been his consort. One, one uh, article I read was very helpful in summarizing this whole, uh, the whole uh, mix here. Um, in 2 Kings 17. I'm just going to read you this, this quick paragraph. Seven gods are listed among the religious cultural baggage of the immigrants. Number one, Succoth Benoth means tabernacles or booths of girls in Hebrew. It has been identified with Sarpanitu, the consort of Marduk, god of Babylon. She also appears as the seed-creating one. Number two, Nurgle was the god of pestilence, disease, and various other calamities. He was worshipped with his consort, um, Ershkegal. Number three, nothing is known of Ashima. Um, number four, Nibhaz perhaps may refer to a deified altar. On the other hand, it may have been worshipped in the form of an ass. Number five, Tartuk is possibly a corruption of Atartagus, I'm sorry, Atargatis, a goddess worshipped in Mesopotamia. And then Adramelech means Gadara is king, and Amalek means Anu is king, 
And um, the latter two were the gods of Syrian or Canaanite deities, and their worship included the offering of children as burnt offerings. Look down at verse 31b. The Sephirvites burned their children in the fire to Adramelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sephorvain. You know, you, sometimes you wonder, you, you, you look at this kind of ancient worship and it's just so grotesque and you think, man, what, fortunately we don't, we don't suffer from that anymore. I remember picking up a book in the library with my boys um, and uh, it, it was talking about South America. So we're reading about South America. And these explorers had discovered this grave um, from about five or 600 years ago of a child who had basically um, been so, they, they had forced to drink so much um, alcohol um, uh, that it was, it, that it died, they died of exposure in a cave. And that was part of this process. They had several documented caves where people, where young people had died. Um, and that was part of the, the worship is that the parents are giving up the children. And so they, they documented this in this, in this um, ancient South American um, tribal culture. And you, start, you look at the news and you see parents getting rid of children, leaving children. I mean, we, we are more culpable for this crime than any pagan culture in the history of mankind. It should not be surprising that they worship God this way when we do as a nation. You think about Succoth Benoth and combining sexual desire with the worship of God. You look at Sepharvaim and the worship of Adramelech and Anamelech and the self-love of parents who would rather just be free and just rather love themselves and serve themselves rather than have the additional burden of caring for uh, dependent children. And you look at all the possible ways we can combine selfish desire with worship, and you have it here. No one goes to sleep one night after a lifestyle of fearing the Lord and then wakes up the next morning with Succoth Panoth in their backyard or an Asherah pole in their driveway. It doesn't happen overnight. What happens? In religious contexts, slow, quiet, subtle compromises are tolerated in the inner man. Verse 9, in secret. And then the religious person starts to fear God to get to benefit personally. Then they fear God and they harbor idols. And then in verse 34 to 41, they fear God and obey partially. They fear God and obey partially. Well, that's actually, let's go back to verse 32. We didn't quite finish that. But notice, they feared the Lord and they appointed high priests in the high places. Verse 33, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. And this syncretism is how they're trying to, quote-unquote, fear God and harbor their idols. Finally, in verse 34, the narrator comes right out with it and just says, they don't fear the Lord. And we just breathe a, uh, a sigh of relief at the clarity. Verse 34 is probably the, one of the few instances in this whole story that doesn't use the fear of God sarcastically as describing this syncretistic, domesticated view of fearing the Lord. And in verse 34 to 41, he describes that they are trying to fear God and they obey God partially. This is the telltale sign of a domesticated view of God. Verse 34, to this day they do according to their earlier customs. They don't fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law or the commandments which the Lord commanded the sons of Jacob. Remember Deuteronomy 6, 25? O Israel, did not the Lord your God command you these commandments for your good as it is this day? Are not the commandments of the Lord for your good? Didn't he give you statutes, strict paths for walking, and ordinances, little boundaries for you to live in, and commandments which were obligated your will, and the law which is instruction for what it means to fear the Lord? Didn't he give you all of that? And they're doing what they need to do to avoid getting eaten by lions, meanwhile not obeying the parts of the law that are in, uncomfortable and difficult. Verse 35, didn't the Lord tell you not to, you should not fear other gods, nor bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them? But didn't the Lord, verse 
36, didn't he tell you to serve him? Him you shall fear, to him you shall bow yourselves down, to him you shall sacrifice. Verse 37, the statutes, the ordinances, the law, the commandment which he wrote for you, you shall observe to do forever, and you shall not fear other gods. This is the covenant. It was an, an agreement that God made with his people. You shall not forget it. You shall not fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hands of all your enemies. End quote, verse 40. Commentator says, however, they didn't, feel, they didn't listen. They did according to their earlier customs. They didn't listen. Meanwhile, they're doing what they need to do to not get eaten by lions. And so while the nations feared the Lord, they also served their idols. The children likewise, and their grandchildren, as their fathers did, so they do this day. Clearly, the fear of God is an exclusive concern. Uh, it's exclusive of concern about man. It's, con- con- it's exclusive of personal desires. It's exclusively transfixed on pleasing God. It's consumed with fearing him. It's terrified of the thought of displeasing him. And this is already preparing us to transition for the positive def- definition and description that we're going to look at next week. But for our purposes this morning, I want to conclude with some implications on our own hearts. When you see this text as a whole, you can see that this generation was really exposed for its stubbornness, its unbelief. It refused to listen. It refused to listen uh, to live for God exclusively. They sought to live for God on their own terms. They sought to use God for their own personal gain. They served the Lord with a price tag. They had an asterisk on their covenant agreement with the Lord. There was conditions. They wanted what they wanted, and they wanted God to get it for them. All you have to do this morning is look at your own heart. And you know that this narrative speaks timeless truths about the nature of mankind. If you're honest with your own heart, you know that self-loving people naturally want a relationship with God uh, when it means that they get personal gain and personal benefit. Nobody naturally wants a relationship with God as defined on God's terms because we are that depraved. But we naturally want the blessings that only God can give. We might have expectations about marriage and about parenting, work, church ministry, financial stewardship, our own respect and reputation. We might have expectations about all these things, and they might be loaded. Those expectations are often loaded with what we want. And we can quite easily twist what we learn about God into... Um, a means of personal gain. We can take biblical principles and even hijack them and plagiarize them for a means of personal gain. But that's much different than the true fear of the Lord. Not only will the fear of the Lord give you transcendency over selfish desires and greed that will rob you of financial um, health. Not only will the fear of the Lord give you power over uh, the tongue so that you can have a better marriage, it gives you power over the natural love of self that puts no price tag on obedience, that puts no asterisk on obedience, that has no sense of expectation except I just long for the privilege of being pleasing to God, no matter what the cost. What if God desires that our relationships are actually difficult and that he gets more glory for himself through them? What if he desires that because we followed biblical principles and because we feared him, we actually don't have temporal resources? Is that okay? Are you consumed with what God wants and not with what you want? Is your fear of the Lord motivated by his glory or by your personal gain? There's so many examples in the scripture of people who, whose worship of the Lord was motivated by personal gain. Nadab and Abihu were motivated by the self, 
significance that came with being anointed and ordained as the first priests in temple worship. That they, in a national scene, in front of a national audience, prepared incense that God did not command, and they were consumed for it. And, and you can read about their ordination process starting in Leviticus 8, and you can read about their death in Leviticus 10. There's so many examples of a fear of the Lord that's an admixture of getting what the person wants and trying to appear as though in a religious context we're fearing the Lord. Think about the very subtle story of Uzzah. Uzzah in 2 Samuel 6, you know the story, he reached out to touch the ark to protect it. You might read that story and think he's motivated by a desire to please God and to glorify him. But then when you read the background, you realize he was disobeying the Lord to even carry it on an ox cart in the first place. He was not a Levite. He should not have been carrying it. That was not the mark of a fear of the Lord. That was a posturing of the fear of the Lord combined with ulterior motives. If it was truly motivated by a desire to please the Lord, he would not have been in that circumstance in the first place. First Samuel 15, 23 says, Is not witchcraft and divination the sin of insubordination? Not doing what God wanted us to do, obeying partially. Is that not the mark of someone who does not fear God in the biblical sense? In whatever way we excuse our, um, our disobedience, in every way, whatever way, however we think about God's commands given to us that we are not maximizing, that we are not sacrificing to, to obey, that we are not doing whatever it takes, using whatever resource God gave us, sacrificing anything within our power in order to put ourselves in a position of maximum blessing to give God all glory with our existence. We might be on a tragic trajectory toward domesticating God. We are not made to live for our own personal gain by means of God. We are made to live for God's glory. Never invert those two. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this story in 2 Kings 17. It's just a very compelling story because, Lord, it speaks directly to us in, in the church. And I just want to pray that uh, as we think about this reality that Lord, your spirit would continue to convict us and give us power to um, use whatever means you've called us to to make sure that we are indeed walking circumspectly, fearing you. And um, Lord, expose the uh, ulterior motives that we often have for what we might view otherwise as just worship of you. Strengthen us, fortify us, give us great discernment over our own hearts. Lord, we will deceive ourselves every time apart from your word. Unless your word comes and exposes the thoughts and intentions of the heart, we would not know the difference of whether we were living for your glory by way of our obedience or whether we are just doing external things while actually just striving for another ulterior motive, namely our own personal good and our own personal gain. And if anyone's confused by the difference, I pray that you would give them opportunity this week to put on display true faith. I pray that even this week there would be a crossroads for, um, for us that we would have the privilege of actually preferring your glory over our own personal gain. And to give us that opportunity, not in the context where it's public, not where it's known, where there still, still could be ulterior motives, but in the secrecy of our own hearts, in the secrecy of our own minds. You give us those opportunities all the time. And I pray that this week would be a week of notable, notable God-fearing. A week where your glory would be our sole desire, our sole motive, our sole delight. And that when you give us that opportunity and we're prepared for it and we count the cost and we give up something that we longed for or something that we had hoped in, and we're glad to sacrifice that at the altar of worshiping you, we'd be able to look back, not with pride, as though we accomplished something great. We'd look back with humility to say, wow, Lord, thank you for answering this prayer even this morning.
of cultivating in us a true fear of you. In your name we pray. Amen.